It is good to be with you guys, with here with you guys this morning. Uh, if you would, just bow your hearts as I open up in a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for the story that you have been working in our lives even before the creation of the world. Father, before you created the first thing on this earth, you knew that you loved us. Father, you knew where each of us would walk. You know all the things that we would do. Father, even the things that would break your heart. And yet, Father God, your love has continued a story in our hearts and in our lives. And today, as we unpack your story, Father God, we pray that your spirit would minister to us, that your spirit would speak to us, change us, and make us more like you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So for those of you that may be here for the first time, my name is Brad, and I'm one of the pastors here. And my beautiful wife, Kelly, is over here in the front row. And we've been married for eight years. And so she has put up with me for eight long years. Um, so, uh, but no, but we are excited that you guys have, have joined us this morning. And Pastor Mark came and he spoke a great message last week. I was, we weren't here, we were out of town, but I was able to watch his message. And he spoke to you guys and gave the story of the blank page. You guys remember that? For those of you that were here, he talked about the blank page. And he did an awesome job of telling the story because we're in a series called A King's Tale. And we're doing it as a story that you've never heard before. And so this morning, I would like to share a story with you. And so as you sit back, you have a handout, and you might say, Brad, you're not giving me points to write answers to. I'm not going to. I'm going to share a story with you. Is that cool with you? All right, awesome. I thought about bringing hot chocolate for you guys so you could sip your hot chocolate, but apparently we have to keep the carpet nice. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. So here we go. I'm going to start the story for you guys, and I hope that... God's story ministers to you. Good news. The king is here. Listen to me. Listen to me. The king is here. Did you hear me? Good news. The king is here. He's come. I mean, you got to catch this. This is really good news. The king, he really is here, and he will fix everything. He is going to make every wrong right. And this king, he will rule with justice, with peace and truth. This is good news indeed, because the king is here. Once upon a time, there was the people of God, Israel, who had waited 400 years without hearing a word from their God. 400 years without God's presence, living in their midst. For 400 years, Israel waited, prayed, wanted, longed for their God to return as king. Ladies and gentlemen, it was time for them to be set free from their oppression under the Roman Empire. It was time for them to return to their promised land. It was time for God to be king and not these evil rulers to be king. The time is now. You see, Israel maintained hope, though, that their God would return. You see, they told these stories over and over again, especially the one from the prophet Zechariah, where he says, O Zion, messenger of good news, shout from the mountaintops, shout it louder, O Jerusalem, shout and do not be afraid. Tell the towns of Judah, your God is coming. Yes, the sovereign Lord is coming in power, and he will rule with a powerful arm. You see, he brings his reward with him as he comes. He will feed his flock like a shepherd, and he will carry the lambs in his arms, holding them close to his heart. You see, this is the hope that Israel had. Their God would return. Then suddenly, one silent night, a light from heaven burst forth and penetrated the darkness. A light so bright, a light so all-consuming that it pushed the veil of darkness back to light the way to Israel's God. The moment Israel had been waiting for has finally arrived. God has returned. The king is here. But in the form of a baby. 
You see, on that dark night, there were shepherds out in the fields taking care of their flock. And out of nowhere, an angel appeared and began to stand before them. And the shepherds, just like you and I, would be terrified. They're thinking, are we supposed to be here? What is happening? Are they coming to kill us? Who is this person? And the angel of the Lord, sensing their fear, calls out to them and declares, don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in cloth, lying in a manger. Upon hearing this truth, it says, the armies of heaven joined that angel praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to with whom God is pleased. Now, if you heard this good news, would you waste any time to go figure out this good news? No, they didn't either. As soon as the angel told them this, they ran to find this king, to find God who had returned. And they immediately made their way to Bethlehem and found Joseph and Mary And there in front of them was the baby lying in a manger just as the angel had told them. And for the very first time, these shepherds met their king. The king is here. You see, they weren't the only ones that wanted to see the king. After they met King Jesus, they went out and they told everyone they knew, good news, the king is here. We've met the king. Come see this king that we have seen and told everyone the good news. But it wasn't just them. There were also three wise men that came from eastern lands. God had given them a star in the sky to guide them all the way to see their king. And when they found their king lying in a manger, it says they bowed down and worshipped their God and offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And at this moment, you can feel that there is something special in the air. Can you not? If you are here during this moment and you were living during this moment, all of a sudden, your God has returned. There is excitement. There is awe. There is wonder. The day of God's return is here, and you can see it. You can feel it. And there is something special going on here. And not only is there something special, but the shepherds have seen him. And the wise men have seen him. And the people that the shepherds told have seen him. People have seen the king that has returned. And not only did those people know that this was no ordinary child, but even Joseph and Mary knew that there was something special about him. Because Joseph himself was visited by an angel. And the angel told him that, he would, that Mary was pregnant by the Holy Spirit. And she would give birth. And they were to name the child Jesus. Why? Because he will save the people from their sins. Then Mary was visited by an angel named Gabriel. And the angel came to her and said, you have found favor with God. And you're going to conceive through the power of the Holy Spirit. And you will name him Jesus. Why? Because he will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And he will rule on David's throne forever and ever and ever. His kingdom will never end. In short, Mary and Joseph now knew the king is here. Can you imagine the excitement of God's people? Imagine you in that spot. Their hope is here. Their king has arrived. A true king. Their world is is going to be put right. Their life is going to be put right. Can you feel it? What could possibly go wrong now? You see, if only everyone was just as excited as Mary and Joseph, the shepherds, and the wise men about the return of the king of the Jews. But there were some people that this was not great news for. You see, the Jewish leaders and the religious leaders, they were not happy to hear that there is a new king in town. Especially King Herod, who was at the time the king of the Jews. He didn't like to hear that there's a new sheriff in town. He loved to take advantage of God's people and take care of the needy and and take advantage of the poor. He wanted the kingdom for himself. And the scriptures say when he found out about this newborn king of the Jews, he became very disturbed and he wanted to meet Jesus. 
He wanted to meet this baby. Do you think he wanted to meet him to worship him? No. King Herod had one goal. I want to meet this newborn king of the Jews so I can take his life and snuff him out so I can maintain myself on the throne as king of the Jews. And so he thought, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell every, I'm going to tell my guards to kill every child, male child, two years old and under. I want them to be put to death in hopes that I could catch this newborn king of the Jews. And that's exactly what his guards did, is went out. And there was mourning and there was weeping among the people of Israel because King Herod wanted to kill the newborn king of the Jews. But you see, God in all his sovereignty and wisdom knew that this would happen. And he warned Mary and Joseph and said, you need to flee to Egypt, take your child to Egypt and stay there. And Mary and Joseph immediately, immediately obeyed without question, fled to Egypt and remained there until King Herod passed away. And after hearing upon his death, they returned. But you see, it isn't just the Jews who weren't happy with Jesus being there. You see, the Romans already had a king. They were upset to hear about this new king. They had a Caesar. This was their emperor. And they believed that this Caesar was not just an ordinary human king. This Caesar was divine. He was a god like all the other gods that they believed in. Rome didn't need a new king. They had Caesar. And here's what I want you to catch. When a Caesar came to power, a herald would go forth into the villages, and he would announce for all to hear, catch this, this is what the Roman heralds would say, good news, we have a new emperor, and his name is Caesar Augustus. Justice, peace, security, and prosperity are ours forever. The Son of God has become king of the world. And this was said about a human king. Now just imagine you're the Roman emperor, you're the Roman governors, you're Roman soldiers, and you hear an announcement saying, good news, the king is here. The God of Israel has returned. He will rule with justice peace, and truth. You see, this announcement was a direct slap in the face to the Romans, and it was a direct slap in the face of the Jewish leaders and for King Herod. They didn't want a king. They were desiring a king who would enforce their kingdom with might and violence and killing people. And to hear this announcement, this was setting up a clash of kingdoms, the kingdoms of the world versus God's kingdom. And yes, a battle would be fought. And yes, a battle would be won. Their world would see a fight like they've never seen before, and there would be a devastating defeat, and the true king would emerge victorious, ladies and gentlemen. The clash of kingdoms has begun. And no matter how much they would want to ignore this truth, the truth still remained. Israel's God had returned. The king is here. This is truly a king's tale, the story of how God became king. Now flash forward a few years to the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. What did Jesus think he was actually doing? How did Jesus really launch God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven? And what did it look like when God became king? You see, these are all questions that many people had about Jesus during his lifetime. And why did people have these questions? Why were they so confused about Jesus, his life? When you look at the Gospels and you read them, you see people are always calling him all sorts of weird things, and nobody ever seems to really grasp who he is. What is it about him? Well, you see, this goes back to the ancient Jewish belief that when the Messiah would return, that he would be a human king and he would rule as a human king and he would come with military might and he would set them free from their oppressors and then he would rule over them and he would come into town on a warrior's horse. This is what the Jews were expecting. Yet when Jesus came to town, he rode into town humbly riding on a donkey. Just like the prophet Zechariah said, look, your king is coming back to you he is righteous, he's victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey. That's right, riding on a donkey's colt. 
You see, what happened was when Jesus came to launch God's kingdom on earth as in heaven, he didn't do it like, any, like anything anyone expected. It was new. It was different. It was exciting. But it was also dangerous. Are you with me? You see, Jesus' public ministry began with his baptism by John the Baptist. And John the Baptist had been prophesied to go before the Lord's coming and the Lord's return, and he was to turn the hearts of God's people, Israel, back to God, and he would tell them, repent, because the Lord is about to come. Repent of your sins. Get your life right, because if you don't get it right now, you're going to miss the king. And if you miss the king, you're going to miss it. And if you miss it, you're not going to be a part of God's kingdom. You're going to be left behind, and you're not going to see it. You're going you're to totally miss the boat. You need to pay attention, because the Lord's coming, and he's coming soon, and you better get it now before it's too late. Jesus goes to John the Baptist and gets baptized. And immediately after his baptism, everybody there heard God the Father's voice from heaven say, this is my dearly beloved son who brings me great joy. You see, Jesus was launching God's kingdom on earth as in heaven because the king is here. And soon after his baptism, the spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the accuser himself, the Satan. This was Satan's opportunity to get Jesus to do what every other human king had ever done and to sin and give into idolatry. So Satan goes out and gives Jesus his worst. Jesus went out for 40 days fasting and praying. He's hungry, he's tired, he's thirsty, he's weak. And Satan comes up to him and says, Jesus, I know you're hungry. Just turn these stones into bread. And Jesus tells him, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Defeated Satan in that one. Then Satan comes up to him and says, you know what? I want you to put God's promises to the test. Doesn't God command that if you were to jump off a building, he's going to have people come and save you? And Jesus responds to him, says, the scriptures say, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Then Satan brings Jesus high up on the mountaintops and has him look out at all the kingdoms of the world and says, look, Jesus, if you will just bow down and worship me, I will give you all of these kingdoms. Yet Jesus, the creator of the world, who created all the kingdoms, who the kingdoms were already his, looks at him and does not say, I'm going to serve you, looks at him and says, you must worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Satan tried his best and failed. And after spending 40 days fasting and praying in the wilderness, Jesus came out of the wilderness, not defeated, not deflated, not weak, not meek, not small. He came out victorious over the accuser, Satan himself. The accuser had met his match. This person, Jesus, is not like all the other human kings. He doesn't fail. He doesn't fall. He's fully relying upon his Father in heaven. This king is different. This changes everything, folks. The king is here. But the reality is this, is that Jesus learned a sad truth as he began his public ministry. He began to look at the people of God at Israel and he saw that they were just as messed up as the rest of the world. They were just as corrupt. They were just as wicked. They were just as idolatrous as the rest of the world. These people who were supposed to be a light to the nations were themselves dark. They were in need of a rescue. And instead of pointing people to their Father in heaven, they were pointing them to the idols on earth. And Jesus was sad about the state of his own people. You see, Israel failed to be a light to the nations. So Jesus became Israel himself to do what Israel could not do. And he became the true light of the world. You see, Jesus knew that his kingdom had to be different in order to usher in God's kingdom on earth as in heaven. Because Israel tried to bring God's kingdom on earth through force and military might and defeating their enemies and killing their enemies. Isn't that what humans do? I'm going to expand my kingdom, and in order to expand my kingdom, I'm going to kill you to expand my kingdom. And this is what Israel thought they needed to do. Crush their enemies. Kill the women. Kill the children. Kill the men. 
because this is how our kingdom's going to advance. And Jesus said, this is not how my kingdom would advance. Because Jesus wasn't going around killing people. He knew the way to change the world, a way to launch his kingdom, was by transforming hearts. Do you hear me this morning? If you change the hearts, you change the people. If you change the people, you change the world. His kingdom had to look different. And as Jesus would go from town to town and village to village, he always drew a crowd. There were people crowding around him, following him everywhere. And why were people doing this? Why were people so excited to see this man called Jesus? Yes, he was the king of the Jews, but there was something else going on here. You want to know what it was? It was because he was healing people. Have you read the stories? Have you seen the healings? The world has never seen healing like this before. I mean, catch it. A person who had the death sentence of leprosy would have one encounter with Jesus and instantly they would be healed. Or you'd have another encounter where people were possessed by demons and enslaved for years and Jesus would walk up to them and command the, the demon to come out of them and these people were set free to live a life that they had never experienced. These were things that did not happen every day. These are things that only somebody special could do, somebody that wasn't just a mere man. He was healing, putting physical bodies, making them right again. There's a story of a man who was crippled from birth, and his friends took him and lowered him through the roof of a house. And there the man is before Jesus, and Jesus looks at him and says, Pick up your mat and walk. And in front of everybody, the man stands up for the first time, picks up his mat, and walks around the house. Would you be amazed? Would you be in awe? Would you be wondering and excited, who is this man that can do such things? Or there's a story of the woman who had a blood issue for many years. Modern medicine at the time couldn't fix it. She heard about this man, Jesus, that he was going to be strolling through town. And she knew, I don't have any other chance but this. This man has been healing people. I know he could fix me. This is my one last chance, and I don't even want to talk to him. I don't even want to have him say anything. I'm just going to reach out, and I know if I could just touch his robe, man, I know I could be healed. So as Jesus walked through the town and walked through the streets, there was the woman laying there, and she stretched out her hand, and her hand touched the robe, and immediately her issue was healed. This was no ordinary man. Now, if you think that was exciting, picture somebody who had been, hello? <laughs> wow, yeah. Can you hear me now? Can you still hear me? Because I'm going to keep flowing if you can still hear me. All right, so here we go. So there was this man who was born blind from birth and could never see, has one encounter with Jesus. Jesus takes mud, spreads it on his eyes, and tells him, go wash in the pool. And if you wash in the pool, you will see. He makes his way to the pool, washes his eyes in the pool, washes himself in the pool, and immediately opens his eyes and for the first time can see trees, for the first time can see sky, for the first time can see faces, could see friends, could see mom, could see dad. For the first time, this man could truly see because of one encounter with this man named Jesus. Now, if you think that's enough, I'm going to go even further. Jesus brought three people back from the dead. Have you ever seen it? You ever seen somebody do that? You ever seen somebody walk into a room, get up, and that person comes out of the casket and dances around? Never seen it. But here Jesus walks up. There's a religious leader named Jairus who comes up to Jesus and says, Jesus, you need to come to my house. My daughter is dying, and if you don't get there, she's going to die, and I know you can heal her. I have faith in you. You can do this. Well, Jesus was delayed getting there, and a messenger came running up to Jairus and said, Jairus, your daughter's dead. And the scriptures say that Jesus overheard that conversation. And then tells Jairus this, don't be afraid, just have faith. So he makes his way to Jairus' house, walks into the room where the little girl was laid, and he gently grabs her hand and then speaks to her and says, little girl, get up. And the scriptures say immediately that girl sat up, stood up, and walked around the house. You see, the king is here and he's changing things. There is new creation happening. God is doing a new thing, and he's telling everybody, you better catch it. Don't miss it. Things are changing. Things are being put right. 
you better grasp onto this. This is what you, you've been waiting for. See, and it wasn't just that little girl. There was another widow who had a son from Nain. Jesus brought, her back to, brought him back to life. Then there was Jesus' own friend, Lazarus, who had passed away. And the scriptures say when he went and saw Mary and Martha weeping and saw the rest of the family and friends weeping, that even Jesus wept himself. And just like the other two, he walked towards the tomb and called out to his friend Lazarus and said, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus, just like everybody else, stood up, got out, and walked out of that tomb. You see, everybody witnessing these things were in awe. They had a lot of questions. Who can do this? Some said, this guy has to be the Messiah. He has to be. Because the only person that could do this is somebody sent from God. But there were others in the crowd saying, this guy is demon-possessed. This is Satan bringing people back from the dead. This guy is a lunatic. This guy is a maniac. He's crazy. So nobody knew what to do with Jesus. The more Jesus announced God's kingdom on earth as in heaven, the more he healed, the more confused the whole world got. They didn't know what to do with this man named Jesus. You see, Jesus wanted to show through his healings that there was something new going on. New creation was happening. People are being put right. And this is why you see Jesus walking on water. This is why you see Jesus silencing the storm. This is why you see Jesus turning water into wine, because he's telling everybody, new creation is here. God is here. Your king is here. Are you paying attention? You see, with these healings, not only was Jesus putting physical bodies right, but these healings were purposeful. These healings were to penetrate the hearts of those who themselves were here, were healed. Jesus wanted to make their hearts right, not just their physical bodies. This is why when you read the Gospels, you will hear Jesus say things like this. So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Stand, pick up your mat, and go home. Or he said another time, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. Or he said another time, now, now you are well, so stop sinning or something even worse may happen to you. You see, Jesus didn't just offer forgiveness of sins after healings. It was all about what his ministry was about. Jesus was always reaching out to sinners and offering them entrance into God's kingdom on earth as in heaven. I mean, think about it. He was going to the worst of the worst sinners and offering them God's kingdom, telling them, I don't care where you've been or what you've done. If you just believe that I am king, if you believe in me, you will be put right, and you will have a place in God's kingdom on earth as in heaven. You see, there's a story where religious leaders were trying to trap Jesus, and they found a woman who was caught in adultery, and they throw this woman before Jesus, and they say, Jesus, this woman was caught in adultery, and the law says that she should be stoned to death what do you say, Jesus? And it says as they asked that question that Jesus stooped down and began writing in the sand with his finger. And he didn't answer them. He was writing. Now you know what impatient people do, right? You want to know an answer to a question, you're going to keep asking. Jesus, when, what do you say? He just writes in the dirt. Jesus, what do you say? Jesus, literally, what do you say? And it says he finally stood up and said, all right. But the one who has never sinned, let him throw the first stone. And he stooped back down again and began writing in the sand with his finger. The scriptures say that one by one, each of the accusers dropped their stone and walked away. Until finally, it was just Jesus and the woman. And he looks at the woman and he says, he stands back up and he looks at her and says, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? And she goes, no, Lord. And he said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. You see, Jesus wants to transform hearts. You with me? He desired to bring healing to the whole person, physical and spiritual. Jesus was ushering in a new exodus of God's people. And people needed to go from death to life. And the only way they could go from death to life was through forgiveness of sin, which is why Jesus was forgiving sins. And you know what this caused to the Jews? This caused 
chaos. This was shocking to the Jews and religious leaders. Why is that? Because forgiveness of sins to them was only possible in the temple. Only God can forgive sins. Who is this Jesus who's going around forgiving sins? He's not even in the temple. Does he think he's God? What is he doing? So every time Jesus would forgive sins, the religious leaders are all upset and they're angry and they're frustrated and they're wanting to kill him and to seek out to him. Because here's the thing, the kingdom is being launched on earth as in heaven and these religious leaders, they're missing it. They're missing the point. They're not realizing that this man is the true king of Israel. And why was Israel blind to this king? Why were they missing it? Again, they were expecting a warrior king to defeat their human enemies. God's kingdom, it does have an enemy. But it's not a human enemy. You see, God's kingdom came unexpectedly. Jesus wasn't defeating their human enemies. Catch this, he was offering salvation to their enemies. You see, he was offering salvation to the Gentile nations, not just Israel. Jesus was showing the religious leaders that, catch this, enemies were becoming friends of God, while the people of God were becoming the enemies of God. Over and over again, Jesus called out the religious leaders for being self-righteous. Jesus came and declared, I didn't come to save those who think they're righteous already. I came to people who knew they were sinners. So if you think you got your act together and you think you don't need any forgiveness of sins and you think you're in God's kingdom just because you're special in your own eyes, you got another thing coming. I'm going to the person who says, have mercy on me. I am a sinner. That's who I want. I want the sick, not those who are self-righteous. And Israel was blind because they thought, just because I was born a Jew, I'm in God's kingdom. And God said, that's not how it works in my kingdom. You get into my kingdom through forgiveness of sins. And there's a new way to become the part of God's kingdom, and it's through transformed hearts. There's no other way. Jesus turned everything upside down for these religious leaders. He told them the temple is no longer even going to be necessary because I'm the temple. Because the temple is where the place where heaven and earth unite. Guess what? Heaven and earth is united through me. I am the true temple. I am the temple that will be in the midst of my people. I will be with them from now until the end of the age. I'm the temple. I'm the place where heaven and earth unite. And you need to look to me to find the place where God meets with his people. So the religious leaders, you can expect it. He's calling out every single thing in their heart, every single idol, every single sin. And at this point, what would you do if you were them? We got to get rid of this man. This man needs to die. We're done. We're done with this guy, Jesus. He needs to die. We got to figure out a way to arrest him. We got to figure out a way to kill this guy. He's causing too much trouble for us. He's taking away our cushy life. Well, finally, they had their opportunity to do that. You see... Judas, one of Jesus' closest friends, betrayed Jesus into the hands of the religious leaders for 30 pieces of silver. And we're going to see that that was the beginning of the true battle and the true fight. You see, Israel thought that their Messiah needed to defeat these pagan nations. But Jesus knew who the real enemies were. It was against Satan himself and against death. For Jesus to claim the ultimate victory, to bring God's kingdom on earth as in heaven, Satan and death had to be defeated. It wasn't an option. And once Satan and death is defeated, catch this, then people would be set free from idolatry, They'd be set free from their rebellion. They'd be set free from their sin. And people would be made right again. They would receive forgiveness of sins. They would have their hearts transformed. And they would inherit not the promised land. They would inherit the whole entire earth. But it took Satan and death to be defeated. And how do you defeat death? You got to take on death itself. Are you with me? This is the mission Jesus had in mind from the very beginning. Death was the result of mankind's idolatry and sin. 
And Jesus knew before the creation of the world that his mission was to come, and he would have to face that hatred enemy of death, and he would have to himself be put to death so he could claim the ultimate victory. And Jesus knew that standing behind these evil rulers, these evil kings, was Satan and his forces. Satan is the greatest accuser. Have you ever been accused by Satan in your life? You messed up in this way. You're addicted to pornography. You're just an angry man. You're a terrible husband. You're, a no, you're not worth anything, wife. How could you even open your eyes in the morning? You should kill yourself because you're bad, you're evil, you're dumb, you're hated, you're wicked, you're evil. The accuser has been ruling over this world for too long, ladies and gentlemen. And Jesus knew that in order to defeat death, he would have to take all the accusations that Jesus launched, that Satan launched at you, and he would take those accusations and bear it upon himself, that he would look Satan in his eyes in that moment and say, do your worst to me. This is how death needed to be defeated. And this is why Jesus warned his disciples repeatedly, I'm going to die, I'm going to suffer, I'm going to be put to death. And when I'm put to death, I'm going to draw all men unto myself. This was his mission. And finally, with that betrayal by Judas of 30 pieces of silver, Jesus was arrested and handed over to the religious leaders. Well, of course, the religious leaders didn't want to get their hands dirty, so they transferred him from there to the Romans and had him stand before Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor. But ironically about that, Pilate didn't find anything wrong with him. Yet his encounter was another clash of kingdoms, Roman Empire versus God's kingdom. And Pilate asked Jesus a question. He said, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus simply replies, you have said it. He was the king of the Jews. He was here. And Pilate, he wanted to release Jesus. He wanted to let him go. He didn't find anything wrong with him. But you know what the people of Israel did? Because of their sin, because of their idolatry, because of their blindness, they said, crucify him. Crucify him. Crucify him. Put this man to death. Pilate gave in to their wishes. Had him whipped, mocked by the Roman soldiers, and then he was led out to the crucifixion site called Golgotha, the place of the skull. And on the way, he fell several times under the weight of the cross. And then a man named Simon had to carry the cross the rest of the way. And then Jesus was nailed to that cross and a sign was put above his, his head that accurately said, the king of the Jews. Of course, the religious leaders didn't like that and said, Pilate, take that off. We don't want that. We have our king already. And Pilate was like, nope, it is stained. So he hung on the cross, the king of the Jews. Folks, this is what it looks like for God to become king. And Israel was missing it. And as the soldiers mocked him, and as the people mocked him, saying, Jesus, you could save everybody else. Why don't you save yourself? If you're truly the Savior of the world, hop down off that cross. Let me see what you can do. And as the world mocked him, the scriptures say Jesus looked at them with love and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Then at just the right time, as the enemy was doing its worst, Jesus cried out, It is finished! And he breathed his last breath, and Jesus died. Immediately upon his death, the veil in the temple tore in two from top to bottom. The Roman soldier at the foot of the cross that was there cried out, This man truly was the Son of God. It is finished, folks. Jesus had finished the work of bringing God's kingdom on earth as in heaven. He took the accuser's worst blow, death. Yet Jesus' death was not his defeat. This is what Paul says. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them. Where? On the cross. This was Jesus' victory, not Satan's victory. The death his death caused a tear in the temple veil. And you know, want to know what that's for? Because it is finished means 
The veil is no longer needed. Heaven and earth have been united because of Jesus' victory. God is here. Heaven and earth has joined together once again, and it was the victorious death of Jesus Christ, not the accuser's victory. And with his death complete, the greatest exodus the world had ever seen has begun. God's love is on display for all to see and to hear. People everywhere from all walks of life can now be set free from idolatry and sin. They can now receive forgiveness of sins. It doesn't matter what you've committed. Your debt has been paid. You are set free from slavery to sin. You have been put right to God. Your vocation has been restored. You become a child of God. You have inherited the world, God's kingdom on earth as in heaven. And catch this, to not miss it, all you need to do is believe that Jesus is the king and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and then you will be saved and receive forgiveness of sins. And catch this, church, the king is here. And Jesus loves you so much. This is why he said to his disciples and for us, there is no greater love than to lay one's life down for his friends. And this morning, Jesus has done that for you. Do you believe that? Amen. So as we close, maybe there might be some of us here this morning that have a lot of questions about who Jesus is, just like a lot of people did. But I would encourage you today Jesus is the true king of the world. Jesus came for people just like you. He came to transform your heart no matter where you've been or what you've done. Today, your heart can be transformed. Today, your life can be put right. Today, you can receive forgiveness of sins. Today, you can receive entrance into God's kingdom. Today, you can experience the Father's love like you never have before. And is it And all you have to do is to say in your heart, I believe that Jesus is king, and I believe that God raised him from the dead. Have mercy on me, a sinner. Christ came for you. His love has come for you. Would you make that decision today? In just a moment, the worship team is going to come out, and they're going to lead us in a song of worship. And I would encourage you, if you've never made that decision let, that, let today be the day you do that. You could do it quietly where you are. You could come down to the altar. You can find Pastor Brian. You can find me. You can find one of our elders that's going to be at the front. But make that decision today. Don't miss out on the kingdom of God. Don't miss it. He loves you and has a plan for your life. Respond to that. For others of you this morning that have been Christians forever, may this story be a reminder of what Jesus has done for us. His death on the cross was our victory over sin and idols in our life. And let's remember that. Let's celebrate that. And let's tell everybody, good news, the king is here. Would you pray with me? Father God, we ask today that you would do what only you can do. That as people see your son Jesus for who he is, that he would transform their hearts, that he would give them forgiveness of sins. And Lord, do it for your honor, do it for your glory, through the power of your Holy Spirit. It's in your name we pray. Amen.